Good morning. Welcome to the Salvation Army here in Southport. As we gather in your presence now, Lord, we will worship. Isn't that great that we can gather to worship so that when we go out of this building, we can continue our lives of worship, whether we're working far away where no one else is looking, whether we're at home with the children, whether we're volunteering in the coffee shop, whether we're out and about in Southport. We gather to worship so that we can live more effectively as worshippers of God in the everyday. So I'm really excited you're here today, and I hope that this next hour or so is going to be meaningful for you. I don't know what kind of frame of mind you've come in today. I'm well aware that today is World Mental Health Day, and there may be people who are struggling. You may be somebody who's feeling tired, weary, looking for still waters to restore your soul, as a friend of mine described himself this morning. You might be somebody, on the other hand, who's upbeat, who's on the crest of a wave, ready to sing your heart out to God this morning. No matter how you're feeling, we can worship God in spirit and in truth, in word and in deed this morning. As we sing our thankful songs aloud, Lord, we will worship. Are we ready to do that this morning? We're ready to make a crescendo of noise, or music maybe. Noise, was, noise is good, but sweet music will be even better. But I think God's, God's fine with either this morning as we sing out our praises. So however you're feeling, I want to say welcome to this part of our life of worship as we gather together as God's people to be equipped, to be encouraged, to be empowered, to be sent out, to be salt and light in a world that needs it. So welcome to worship this morning. We're going to share a short uh, reading together. You did so well last week, we thought we'd do something similar this week. So the words are going to come on the screen now, and I'm going to invite you to 
read the bit in red which says all. That's the clue and I'll be the leader for this morning. So we start together by saying we believe in God the creator who spoke everything into being by his word and by his spirit, the physical and the spiritual, the extraordinary and the everyday. We believe in God the just, who sees our mistakes and our fallenness, who judges sin and will right every wrong. Open our eyes, God, to see your story. We believe in God the incarnate, who came as one of us in Jesus Christ, who knows our weakness and yet chose obedience. Open our eyes, God, to see your story. We believe in God the Saviour who reconciled all things to himself on the cross and commits us to the message of reconciliation. We believe in God the Restorer, who will come again to renew creation and cause us to play our part as we long for that completeness. Open our eyes, God, to see your big story. And we've been thinking about the big story of God well, for, for years, of course, but focusing particularly on the big story of God as revealed in his word, the Bible, over the past year. And so what we want to do this morning is put God in his rightful place because he's the author, he's the creator, he's the perfecter, he's the artist of this wonderful picture which we call our world and over which he's given us responsibility to make the very best of his gift to us. So we're going to stand together and sing and invite our singers to come forward. We're giving the band a rest for this opening song because they've got a beautiful piece of music that they're going to play straight afterwards. So we're going to start by giving thanks to our Lord, our God and King, because his love endures forever. And then the band are going to usher us into a moment of stillness as we're still and recognize that God is God. So let's worship together. I invite you to stand as we sing. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. It's love and yours forever. For the life that's been reborn is love and yours forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise forever. Rising to the setting sun, his love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on his love endures forever. Sing praise. Forever. 
is faithful. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. Forever, forever. Forever. I think it sounded better without it.
Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, as we pause in the stillness, as we find comfort in the peace, may we hear your still, calm, reassuring voice. As we've just read on the screen and reflected on the words that the, the band have played the music to, God, you are a God who speaks through the storms of life. A God that when all is raging around us, we can be confident of your presence, your faithfulness, and your love and that you are in control of all things and so again God in the stillness we listen for your voice We thank you that you love us, that we can find shelter under your wings, that we can find comfort in your presence. And God, I pray that this morning our souls will be refreshed, our souls will be restored, and that we will be able to go with confidence into our situations, our home lives, our work lives, our day-to-day -day lives, whatever they may be, we can go knowing that you go with us. And you will not let us down. And we can live every day, every day, in the knowledge that we are your children and your loving hand will guide us. So, Father, I pray for each and every one of us here this morning, for those who are watching at home, for those who will watch during the week, for those people that would love to have been here but can't be this morning for whatever reason. God, I praise you for each one of us, and I pray that you will unite us in your love and that we will continue to build one another up so that we will be the people that you want us to be. God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that are open to you. And so, God, I pray that this morning you will be honored and glorified in all that is done and said and sung. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Only just before our meeting, we prayed, and we prayed for the, for the Lord to speak to us this morning, to use the quiet, to use the calm, and I hope that you were, you were blessed by that band piece this morning. One thing I'd ask you to, to pray for this week, there's a number of people in, in our family that just need prayers, people associated with us as a church. Have a look in our Outlook magazine, all their names are in there, so please, please, just remember them. I'd also invite you to pick up one of these leaflets. Uh, they're going to be, I think there's some on the back table, and they're going to be in the coffee shop next to where we'll be able to share after the meeting. It's Prisons Week, if I hold it the right way up. We're pri privileged as an organization and as a church to be able to work in the prisons in this country. And there's an opportunity for, for you to support the people that, that do that ministry, but also to pray for the people that are, have found themselves in that, that situation of being in, in prison at this time. So please, I'd encourage you to, to pick up one of these and just follow it through for this coming week and just uphold all, the, all those requests that are in there in your prayers. As I said, please 
look in the Outlook magazine. There's information about the persecuted church. There's people in our core family that need our prayers. So it can't be, there's nothing more important, is there, than to just uphold them at this time. It is great to welcome visitors. I believe we've got people from Scotland, and it's great to see you. It's lovely to see Cara back with us. And it's, uh, <coughs> it's just great to be able to share together this morning. All our weekly program has been coming up on the screen. It's in the Outlook magazine. Again, please pick up your copy, and it'll tell you exactly what's going on. It's great that we're back to nearly a full program. After our meeting this morning, I'd invite you to join us just through in our coffee shop. With the wherever it is, we'll be, we can join out in the garden as well. And let's just share in fellowship over a cup of tea and a cup of coffee. So finally, I just thank you for listening this morning. And I just pray that you'll be blessed this morning and the Lord will really speak to you through something that happens today. I'll pass back to, I think it's Alison now. No, it's Michael. Well, you've been sat very, uh, very well this morning, and I think you'd probably want to get your, get your minds thinking, get a bit interactive here. So I want to ask you a very simple question, and it's a question we've asked many times before. But what will you be doing? Where will you be this time tomorrow? And uh, we have Alan here. He's roving mic man. So if anybody would be bold enough to put their hand up and just tell us where you'll be this time tomorrow, that would be great. Look, Alan, you've got to come all the way across to see your mother-in-law now. sister-in-law who during lockdown have moved to a new house so we'll be seeing that for the first time as well so we thank God that we've got the freedom to, right. to go. So you're visiting family, brilliant, that's excellent. Peter where will you be? I'll be going to see our ex next door neighbour who very faithfully gives a lot of stuff to the Salvation Army. She's got some pictures which she said I can collect so they'll be coming into the charity Great. shop. Great, lovely. So spending time with neighbours or ex neighbours I'll be in the swimming pool. In the swimming pool. Bobbing away. Brilliant. Good stuff. Over. Oh, Alan, the other way. There you go. Hi, I'll be at uh, Ainsdale, <coughs> Ainsdale Lunch and Leisure in the morning. Uh, we're opening our coffee shop for the first time since the, the lockdown. Right. So it's opening that. Did you get that, Ainsdale? What was it, Ainsdale? Ainsdale Lunch and Leisure. Ainsdale Lunch and Leisure. Alan, there's one more here, unless you want to take the long route. I'll take the long okay, route. he'll be back. He'll be back. I will be in the coffee shop tomorrow morning, serving, well, coffees, hopefully, <laughs> and teas, <laughs> and sandwiches. Uh, the plan is that I'll be studying before my lesson in the afternoon. Whether that happens or not, I don't know, but that is the plan. <laughs> I, together with the, the maintenance team, will be back here in the hall tomorrow looking into the repairs and refurbishment of the old building, particularly the staff quarters. Let's just send him from one corner to the other, shall we? I'll be sat in my chair with my feet up and a cup of coffee and a scone. <laughs> it's marvellous, doesn't it? Marvellous. I'm looking forward to retirement. Anybody else? We've got people who'll be at work, haven't we? I know Abby will be... Well, Abby, Abby's going to speak, I won't say. It's my break duty on a Monday, so I'll be outside, regardless of the weather, with 60 10-year-olds. Can't wait. <laughs> Um, I'll be on the train back to Durham. Whereabouts? Which station? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody else want to tell us where you'll be this time tomorrow? Okay, well, we've got a lot of staff there, haven't we? We've got people who are going to be visiting family. Got people who will be visiting neighbours or ex-neighbours, spending time with them. People out engaging in leisure activities, no doubt meeting people. You might see people regularly, uh, Sheila, who you see quite frequently, uh, either at the pool or afterwards. Opening up a new coffee shop, making a difference in Ainsdale. At university, my goodness, don't we need Christians in the world of university and education at this time? 
coming here, being salt and light to the guests in the, the coffee shop. At home, restoring your soul and spending time with Charles. And Alfie, the dog, no doubt, chasing Alfie up and down the road. So many opportunities to be like Jesus. What are some of the challenges that we face in the everyday? Anybody like to just say what, what challenges we might be facing this time tomorrow as Christians living in this world today? Anybody just want to pop your hand up? No challenges. This is fantastic. Wow, what a church we are. Carol. Conversations. Conversations. Our conversations matter, don't they? The kind of conversations we have. How we, how we reflect Jesus in those circumstances. Anybody else? Our attitudes. Our attitudes. Yeah. The impression that we make on somebody. They may not even get to talking about Jesus with us, but our attitude might speak volumes one way or another. Anything else? Apathy. Apathy. Ours or other people's? Yeah, it's not easy, is it, being a Christian? Because by and large these days we don't live in a, what we might call a Christian culture. Some people even say it's a post-Christian culture. We're not a Christian nation anymore, by and large. Most people aren't really interested. So how do we, how do we become Christians who actually overcome that by the way that we are? One more, anybody else? Major Christine. Saying the right thing at the home league. <laughs> or indeed in any other place, Major Christine. Yes, saying the right thing. Engaging the brain and the heart before opening the mouth. Yes, J the book of James says a lot about that, doesn't it? The power of the tongue for good or bad. There's so much that we can pray about, isn't there? Sometimes we come and we think, this is it, this is the big thing, Sunday morning is it, but actually it's a preparation for this time tomorrow. So Alison, I'm going to ask you to hold the other sheet up now, otherwise all your work was in vain. Oh, okay, that's clever. We've got it on the screen. So let's have them both anyway. Rip it off. That's it. Brilliant. <laughs> So, so these are some of the places we're going to be, and this is just a small group of people. These are some of the places we'll be this time tomorrow, and these are some of the challenges we'll be facing. And even if you didn't put your hand up, you might find yourself doing the same kind of uh, thinking in your head. I know we've got, we've got music teachers in our congregation. We've got people who are very active in their retirement. We've got people in the world of uh, nuclear stuff. I still don't know what that means, but we've got someone in the world of nuclear stuff. We've got people in the building trade. We've got people who have something to do with plastics. We've got people, uh, IT people. How do we apply our faith to those contexts? And how do we apply our faith to our contexts when we're retired? A really good definition of discipleship I want to share with you. I've shared it before, but this is it. And can we pop it on the screen? Disciples are people who are learning the way of Jesus in their contexts at this moment. A disciple is a learner. It's not somebody who's got it all sorted. The Greek word for disciple, mathetes, means learner, apprentice. We are constantly learning the way of Jesus. Where are we doing it? In our context, in the school, in the IT world, in the coffee bar, with our neighbours, with our friends. In our context at this moment. And that's why this time tomorrow matters because we want to be praying for you. We want to pray that you'll be salt and light to the people you meet wherever you are. One more slide to show you. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you do, just remember this. You are God's person in that place. You'll be shaped by your circumstances because we're always learning. And you'll be thinking, how do I apply God's word to this situation? But I want to assure you that every one of you matters. What you do today matters, and what you do this time tomorrow matters, because you're all Monday morning missionaries, whether you believe it or not. You may not believe in yourself sometimes, but God believes in you enough to give you the gospel, the good news, so that you can be good news people. So I'm just going to pray for all of us, in a sense, to commission us that this time tomorrow we might live for Jesus just where he's placed us, whatever we're doing. So let's pray together. Loving Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for my friends here this morning. As we've heard just a little bit about their various 
uh, varying contexts, what they'll be doing this time tomorrow. We recognise that those who've spoken are just representatives of the wider body of this core, this church fellowship. And I want to pray for each one of us that as we continue to learn the way of Jesus in our context at this time, that you will help us that you'll give us your Holy Spirit to guide us. You'll help us to think about what it is we're going to say and your Holy Spirit will help us with the words. You'll help us to know what to do, how to act, how to react, how to work with integrity, how to treat people with dignity, how to live for you just by going about the things we do in our ordinary, everyday lives. So Lord, let us now be commissioned to live for you tomorrow. And I pray that when we get to the end of the week, we'll look back and think, do you know what? God worked through me. It's remarkable, but he really did. Help us to look. Help us to listen for those opportunities to be like you, to the people around us, because this world really needs Christians who love you. I make this prayer now, Heavenly Father, in your name. Amen. We're going to have a song now. You might want to listen. You might want to join in. It's one we've had a few times before. Uh, Join in, please, is the request. It's very simply says, all your promises are yes and amen. And God's word says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He'll be with you this time tomorrow and through the week. So if you'd like to stand, we're going to sing, all your promises are yes and amen. And then after that, I'm going to invite Millie to come forward and bring us our Bible reading. You have poured out grace. You got me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful you
This is a reading taken from Philippians chapter 1 to 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Jesus Christ at Philippi, together with the overseers and de deacons, grace and peace to you from, all, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for you, all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have, since I have you in my heart and where, whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you to how I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to dis discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ the glory of the glory and praises of God. Amen. Thank you, Millie. So this morning we are continuing our journey through the Bible and we're spending a few minute few minutes, a few weeks just pausing in the New Testament looking at the letters. Many of the letters are written by Paul and hopefully next week Rodney will be restored to full health. You will notice that we haven't enrolled them this morning. Um, Rodney's been unwell this week, but hopefully they will be back to full health. We will enroll them as soldiers next week and he will be uh, preaching on the letter to the Ephesians. This week then, I'm picking up just a few thoughts um, from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. But first, a man goes into a baker's shop and asks for a loaf of bread. Brown or white? says the baker. Doesn't matter, says the man. I've got my bike outside. <laughs> now I know you're, you're all wanting to laugh <laughs> and think that it's got the format of a joke, but you know, some things in life just don't make sense. Do they? Some things, you, you, you want them to make sense, but they just don't. There are questions in life where we can philosophize until the cows come home. Questions like, where did God come from? What's at the end of space? What's the point of a mosquito? And we can debate these, we can philosophize, we can mull, and then we'll go and make a cup of tea and carry on as normal. But then there are questions that just, somehow the answers are so unsatisfactory. And it's these questions that are the really tough questions. The, the questions in life that cause us pain the ones that affect our daily lives, the ones that cause hurt. You know, I, I, I can sleep at night and I can live without knowing where did God come from or what's at the end of space. That's not going to disturb me too much that I don't know those answers. And as for mosquitoes, well, they're just an annoyance. But there, but there are some questions and some situations that cause us a deep sense of unease. 
A while ago, I had a conversation with someone who asked me the ultimate difficult question. And it was extra hard because it wasn't the time then for a, a theological, fully researched textbook answer. Or, or one that we, we could debate for some time. This was about a real person whose heart was breaking. And the question, why do bad things continually happen to me? Have I been really bad? Am I being punished for something? Have you ever asked that question or been asked that question? And no matter what you say or think, there is nothing that gives a satisfactory answer to that one. And as I spoke with this person, my heart was physically hurting for her as she listed her pain, her divorce from an abusive husband, her struggles with church rejection over the breakdown of her marriage, the custody battle for her child. And through the tears, I could only feebly say, I don't know. I don't know why these things are happening to you. And then she said something to me that in its simplicity and sincerity astounded me and challenged me to the very core. Amidst all her struggles, she said to me, even if I never see my child again, I know God has it all in his hands. And for her, her faith, her trials, and her testimony was that whatever life throws at her, following her God is a life worth living. For someone who has faith, my friend's testimony was that whatever life throws at her, whatever life throws at her, following her God is a life worth living. And even as we spoke together and as we prayed together, it wasn't about finding answers to those persistently difficult questions. It was about digging deep into what we actually believe about God, about who he is and about having the knowledge that Christians aren't always called to fix things and to give answers. We were called just to be there, to pray, and to love. John Ortberg writes in one of his books, we tend to be preoccupied by our problems when we have a heightened sense of vulnerability and a diminished sense of power. And he says that today, we need to see each problem as an invitation to prayer. And I wonder, how often do we try and look for answers to impossible situations when what we should be doing is looking to prayer? One of my favorite artists at the moment is Hannah Dunnett. I don't know if you've seen any of Hannah Dunnett's pictures. We've got some in our household. And she paints a picture and incorporates our, um, Bible texts around the artwork. There's one in the foyer. And one of them has the words from our Bible reading this morning, which is Philippians 1.3, which says, I thank my God every time, whenever I remember you. And Paul continues in this chapter that Millie read to us about how he prays for the Christians of Philippi and how he holds them close in his heart. And this is what challenges me about these opening verses of Philippians. Yes, it's a prayer of thanksgiving. It's uplifting. It's a cel celebration. But it is, in fact, enormously challenging. As you look around the room this morning, what do you see? 
Do you thank God for the people that are sat in this room regularly? Do we rejoice in the lives of each other? Do we regularly bring each one of us and each other to God in prayer? If you have an outlook, you will see that not only do we have specific prayers for those in need, but we have specific prayer requests for members of our church fellowship. We're going through the roles, the people that we have, that we know attend each week, putting in five or six people, the next people down the list. So we are praying for one another in this church family. You know, if we want to grow spiritually and numerically here, and I believe that we do, we need to be starting to look out, or we need to continue to look out for each other and thanking God for the people he has already given us. Philippians 1 verse 7 says, It's right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace. A couple of years ago, I went to visit this lady, call her Dawn. She was perhaps in her late 40s. Six months previously, she had lost her husband after a short illness. They'd only been married for a couple of years, and the rawness of emotion for a life that could have been, and the sheer grief was almost tangible. And I sat with this woman for, for an hour maybe, or, or for two hours, I'm not sure, and I went there with, with the, um, to, to try and bring her some comfort, to somehow support her. But I barely said a word. I didn't need to. Because even in her time of grief and her heartbreak, she shared with me through many tears, she was sobbing and sobbing, but she shared with me scripture after scripture, prayer after prayer of how God loved her, of how he was faithful to her, of how he had given her two precious years of marriage with a man that she loved. And for that, she would be eternally grateful. So why have I shared these two stories with you this morning? To depress you? No, of course not. I'm sharing these stories to encourage, to excite, to inspire. And you say, how? But actually, we have here two real-life examples of two women whose testimonies are that walking hand-in-hand hand with God is far better than any alternative. And this is the life worth living that Paul is getting excited about in the beginning of um, his letter to the Phili um, in Philippians. You know, I, I could have told you stories of good times. I've got lots of those. But it's easy to be a Christian in good times, isn't it? There are times, though, when people around us confront us with questions that we can't answer with situations where we, we can't see a way out, with periods of life that we feel unable to pray. There are times when life just doesn't make sense. And there's no easy fix for this. But this is what the reality of being a whole life disciple is all, around, all about. And I think one of the things that we can learn from those opening words of Philippians is that each problem, each situation, each celebration can be an invitation to hold one another in prayer. And this is when our love grows. For it is my prayer, writes Paul, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discern discernment, that you may approve what is excellent, so that you may be pure and blameless, so that you may be filled with the fruit of righteousness. And if you are able to read through the book of Philippians, it's just four chapters, maybe it's some afternoon reading, you will see how being a disciple of Christ really is a worthwhile life. Philippians is one of Paul's lockdown letters, if you like. 
He wrote it whilst in prison, probably in Rome. And I'm imagining that given what we know and understand of the Roman regime, being in prison is not really a time to be celebrating. And yet he writes this letter to encourage and inspire us. So what's Paul's inspiration? Imagine, if you will, the US Tennis Open. It's the day of the final and two young women walk onto court. For several weeks they've been defying the odds. They fought off the competition. They've won points and sets and games and matches. They've wowed the crowds. And now the day of the final, the trophy is polished and set on the stand. The court attendants have taken the place. The crowd is buzzing with anticipation. 9.2 million people tune in on their TVs to watch. The tension is mounting. A great sporting achievement is on the cards. The two women take their place at either end of the court, adrenaline pumping. This is the moment that they've been working so hard to get to, a defining moment in their career. And then... One of them drops her racket to the ground and announces, I said, everyone, I'm done here, game over, and walks off the court. Imagine all that training, all that hard work just to call it quits, just so I'm done here. It's all too much. Let me leave you with one more verse. Philippians 1, verse 6. And I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He will continue his work in you until it is finished. This is the inspiration and confidence in Christ that Paul has. This is what motivates him and how he tries to encourage his readers. God, who has started a good work in you, will finish it, will deliver it. I started with a couple of illustrations of life in the tough lane. But as Nicky Gumbel writes in his book, A Life Worth Living, the hallmark of the true Christian is that he endures. A faithful Christian may lose his or her job, money, liberty, health, or even life, but they can never lose eternal life. So let me finish with words from Philippians 3, verse 14. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We're going to listen to a piece of music. And the invitation of Philippians 1, as I said, is an invitation to prayer to uphold one another in prayer and to know what a life in Christ is all about. When my heart was so broken that I could not pray, when love wasn't easy to see, someone was there, somebody cared, somebody prayed for me, somebody went to the throne of heaven Somebody lifted my name, bringing me into his holy presence, saying what I could not say.
We're going to end our meeting in a moment and uh, I'm going to invite you, if you'd like to, just to leave quietly, if you'd like to stay and pray. For all the different things that have been going on this morning, then you're very welcome to. If you'd like to be prayed for, then please just make yourself known at the end of the meeting. But I think it's appropriate we draw the meeting to a quiet conclusion rather than the way we planned. Um, Brian, you might like to see if the band can play one or two appropriate tunes. That would be lovely. But I just want to read the words that we've just seen and then close in prayer. Somebody went to the throne of heaven. Somebody lifted my name, bringing me into his holy presence, saying what I could not say. Somebody showed me the face of mercy when darkness was all that I could see. Somebody pleaded the blood of Jesus. Somebody prayed for me. At this time, there are many people who need our prayers. So let's, above all, be a praying community, asking that God will do his will in us and through us at this time. And this is my prayer, says St. Paul to the Philippians, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. May God bless you all.